All right, so as Jen says, this might be quite tough, especially at the end of a long day with plenty of technical issues, but I'll do my best to help you through what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm gonna start off just by giving you some notation before I tell you what I'm actually going to be doing, just so you can read what I'm doing on the slides. So in particular, the important thing is how I'm using the colon. So when I do write a letter, colon, or something else, I'm saying the thing on the left-hand side of the colon is of the kind on the right-hand side. So maybe if you subscribe to set theory, you could read the colon as instead a membership symbol. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about pairs of things a lot in this talk, and I'm gonna indicate that with either a product symbol or a direct sum symbol. And when I'm talking about things that are a pair, I'm gonna write that as a pair of parentheses with two items between them. Uh, and you can see I'm using colon equals to say, this thing is this value. Yeah. Uh, so for example, the next one is a function. Functions I'm gonna write with an arrow. Uh, so for instance, the function v to two v, again, I'm using a, a different symbol for actually implementing the function. So the maps to symbol. Uh, where my notation maybe gets a bit weird is if I have a function of two arguments, so like this g, I'm gonna write it as a function from A to a function from A to A. So I'm sort of currying or uncurring, depending on which way around it is, this function. So for instance, the function where I just add two things together is a function that sends X to the function that sends Y to X plus Y. And this just turns out to be convenient notationally for what I'm gonna do in the rest of this talk. Moving on to more familiar notation, I'm gonna use curly G with uh, reals to PQR for geometric algebra. Uh, and when I write this, what I'm talking about is the geometric algebra over the real vector space spanned by the standard positive, negative, and null basis vectors. But actually, this isn't really what I want to talk about. I don't want to limit myself to these real geometric algebras parameterized in this way. I want to talk about the general case where I have a geometric algebra over a vector space V parameterized by a quadratic form Q, where the quadratic form sends elements of the vector space to elements of the field or the ring. Uh, so for instance, in our standard RPQR, the quadratic form is implemented by um, summing the squares of all the positive coefficients and subtracting the squares of all the negative coefficients. So that's how to translate the typical RPQ uh, formulation into this quadratic form formulation. Okay, now that I've done that, I can start to talk about what I actually wanted to talk about. So a, a key thing throughout this talk is the isomorphism between a Clifford algebra and a larger even subalgebra. So for instance, the complex numbers you can represent with a single basis vector that squares to minus one, or you can decide that actually you're going to send i to a bivector. So you can instead make it be the even subalgebra of a two-dimensional Clifford algebra. And same with the quaternions. You can either have two basis vectors that square to minus one, or you can look at the even subalgebra and have three that square to minus one. And how do you implement this? Well, let's say we're looking at R3. You can just add a E minus basis blade basis vector to each of the odd size blades. So we add it to these ones because they're uh, vectors. We don't add it to the bivectors vectors because they're already even, and we add it to the pseudoscalar. And you can kind of see how this would extend to one dimensions. And this is bijective. You can obviously go in the other direction. There are no even basis vectors. There are no even basis blades that aren't included in that bottom row. It's obviously linear, but it's not entirely clear that this is basis independent. Maybe if we picked our basis vectors to not be orthogonal, this strategy wouldn't actually produce a useful map anymore. Uh, and if you actually to implement this in software, what you end up doing is unpacking all the coordinates and putting them back together in another order. And GA sells itself as being coordinate free. So this kind of feels like we've totally missed the mark. Uh, so what if we want to look at the general case? And in the general case, we're taking the algebra over a generic quadratic form Q, and we're sending it to the algebra where ad we're adding one more coefficient. So instead of using the vector space V, we're taking the direct sum of V and the scalars. So adding the coefficient for that new basis blade. And our quadratic form over that new V plus R E minus is just the quadratic form for V minus R squared. And again, we can write down the math in exactly the same way where we add E minus to all the odd graded elements and we don't do anything with the even ones. Uh, but is this well-defined in the same way that when we had our basis vectors earlier, it wasn't clear that changing basis would leave the result the same. It's not clear that we can do this at all in the general case. So can we compute it without having a basis at all? Because if we can do it that way, we don't need to think about does a change of basis affect our computation? So to outline where this talk is going, using that um, isomorphism as a motivating example, we're gonna look at the universal property of the Clifford algebra, which will let us make the forward direction. Uh, we'll look at some recursion techniques from functional programming that sort of tell us how to soup up the power of this universal property, which is otherwise quite hard to use. And then using that, we'll construct a universal property for the even subalgebra, which I haven't seen anyone else do before. And finally, I'll discuss the relevance of all this strange abstraction to formalization 
So informally, the universal property says if we have a function from V to some space A, we can construct a function from the Clifford algebra of V to A by sending one to one, sending all our vectors through our desired lowercase f function, and then just extending linearly and multiplicatively. Uh, it's sort of similar to the automorphism, which you might be familiar with, which sends a linear map from V to W to a linear map between the exterior algebra over V to the exterior algebra over W. But the two differences here are we're using the geometric product, not the wedge product. And instead of going into the exterior algebra, we're going into any algebra we like. So actually A here is an algebra. So for example, if you apply big F to one plus two E one plus three E one two, you can see how it distributes over each of those terms. So we're applying it to a single vector at a time. But this isn't well defined on all F. If we have a function that just sends every vector to zero, then we can say, well, one is clearly F one. And we know that E one squared is one but we can split that multiplicatively, and then we find that one equals zero. So clearly we're not allowed to do this unless our lowercase f satisfies some properties. Uh, so we'll look at this formally. And the formal statement of the universal property is that for any choice of R algebra A, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these linear maps from B to A that satisfy F of V squared is the quadratic form, which precludes this zero map we looked at earlier. And algebra morphisms from the Clifford algebra to A. So these are linear maps that also multiply preserve multiplication and one. So pictorially, there's this standard embedding from the vector space into the Clifford algebra. And if you have a function from that vector space to an algebra A, then that function can be extended to a function from the Clifford algebra to A. And it turns out lowercase f factors exactly through that diagram. So you can always rewrite f, lowercase f as big F applied to the vectors promoted up into the larger space. And I'm gonna write this operation with the word lift which takes from the small map to the big map. So let's go back to our motivating example. So this is the one that just adds the E minus to all the odd graded elements. Uh, the natural thing to try is, well, we have this function that we can apply to every vector. So let's just send every vector to itself times E minus. And we can try this out on the even graded things. If we apply it to UV, we see the two E minuses cancel and the signs cancel when we get what we want. So then the next question is, are we allowed to apply the universal property? Does it satisfy the condition? The one that, so we need F to be linear, which it obviously is. And we need F of V squared to be equal to the quadratic form. And we can try this and it, again, it obviously is. So that's using the result from the line above. So that means we've now built the forward direction of our map using only the universal property with no mention of the of coefficients or of a basis. Uh, the universal property also has some other interesting applications. Uh, one of them is that I've described how you can apply the universal property, but it also turns out that if there is a universal property, then the object you're working with must be the Clifford algebra. So you don't need anything, know anything about the Clifford algebra other than it is an algebra and it has this universal property. And you can say, right, that's an algebra. So what that means is that you can have two software libraries and all they need to agree on is the universal property and they can interface with each other. So for instance, in library A, I can implement the universal property by just breaking up my coefficients and gluing them all back together again after applying F. And I can then implement this two even function that takes a multi-vector from library A and turns it into an even multi-vector from library B. And I didn't need to know anything about the coefficient representation inside A because the universal property told me all that information. And now my implementation is completely coordinate free. Uh, I can actually just use this to go directly from multi-vectors of A and B because I can lift the obvious inclusion map. So if I take the inclusion map of library B and I lift it with library A, then that just sends multi-vectors between the two libraries. So in a sense, the universal property could be a universal interface, a universal interface between software libraries. In practice, it's not gonna be computationally efficient. To give a few more examples of the universal property, uh, grade involution is an easy one. You take every vector and you send it to its negation. Uh, you can check this satisfies the rules. So f of v squared, the signs cancel and you get the quadratic form. So now we can define grade involution by the, the universal property. Grade reversal is a bit more tricky. We need to build this new algebra. So we build this thing called the opposite algebra, which behaves exactly like the original algebra, but multiplication swaps. And so when we're doing grade reversal, we send every vector into this opposite algebra. So when we multiply them, the multiplications actually happen in the wrong order. So when we take it back out of that opposite algebra, we've successfully reversed every basis blade. And this kind of shows what the key trick we're doing here is. We have to pick a clever algebra to map our universal property into. And then we need to take the result we get after applying it and clean it up. So in this case, the cleanup was take it back out of the opposite algebra. Uh, 
So the rest of this talk is going to be showing how to choose these clever algebras in order to compute more interesting things. To do that, we're going to look at how you can, when in functional programming, if you've got a limited recursion rule, how you can build more complex recursors out of simple recursors. So for instance, if you're defining a function on a list, you can define it simply by saying what its value is on the empty list and what its value is on a list with one extra element stuck on the front in terms of its value on the first half of the list. So in this case, we can define the sum of a list by saying, well, on the empty list is zero and on A concatenated with L, it's just A plus the sum of L. And our rule is that we're only allowed to refer to sum of L on this right-hand side. We're not allowed to put anything else in the brackets. Uh, and just to prove I haven't made this notation up, there are two programming languages down the bottom that have similar syntaxes. Let's look at a more complicated example. So here we're going to compute something that accumulates. So it'll take a list of entries and it'll produce zero, and then it will slowly add each entry and turn along the list. We can't directly apply this recursion principle here. We need to do it in two steps. So what we do is we pick our clever result value to be functions from the entries of the list to a new list. And so we write this accumulate from function that instead of starting at zero, starts at a value of our choosing. And note, we're still following the rule of whom from only appears with L as its argument. Then as our post-processing step, we just initialize that starting value to zero. So the game here was all about making sure that when we recurse, we do it in a way that's allowed. In the same way that when we go back to the universal property, we have to make sure the functions we apply it to are the ones that square in an appropriate way. Uh, the last one I'm going to look at is when we need ex so extra outputs on our recursion. So in this case, instead of accumulating forward, we're going to try and accumulate backwards. And obviously you could do this by implementing a reverse function, but this demonstrates my point better. Uh, so here we're going to keep track of what the head of the list is as we iterate through so that we can use that on the next recursion. And the details aren't super important, but the important thing is this use of the product to push more information through our recursion. And again, this is possible in a real programming language. I'm not just making this up. So to recap, there are two types of things that we should choose to be our outputs of these recursions or these universal properties. Uh, if we choose functions, we can push extra state into the inner recursion steps. And if we choose products or direct sums, we can pull extra state out. And we can compose these two things. So for instance, if our output type of the recursion takes a state S and maps it to a product of S and our chosen output, then we can sort of iterate this state S alongside our recursion. So we can retrieve it at every step, modify it, and send it to the next step. We're now ready to go back to the universal property. Uh, unfortunately, we can't use functions as our output type because functions aren't an algebra. But what is an algebra is the space of our linear maps from a vector space W to itself, also known as the endomorphism ring, the endomorphism algebra of W. And this is defined such that one is just the identity map, multiplication is function composition, and the scalars are sort of just multiplication by a constant. So what this means is we can now apply the universal property to this function, to any function with this in its codomain, and we can rewrite the f squared equals q into f applied twice equals q scaled by this w. So we've just sort of manipulated the um, symbols to turn the multiplication into composition. Uh, and so if you apply this to some things, you can see that if you apply it to a vector, you just get your original f applied to that vector. If you apply it to one, you get your um, kind of initial state w naught. And if you apply it to a product, you apply it to the right half of the product and then pass that into the initial state to the left half of the product. So we're sort of sending this w naught through our step one vector at a time. Uh, and as an example, if we wanted to apply, lift this, uh, family of endomorphisms to E12, we can see we apply it to E1. So we apply it to E3 first, we then pass that result into as the second argument to when we do it E2. And so we're folding it over all the terms in our products. So now let's look at the universal property of the even sub algebra. Um, intuitionally, we want to take a function that takes two vectors into an algebra and converts that into a function from the even sub algebra to that same algebra. And again, we're going to define the function on one to be one, the function on the product of two vectors to be that function applied to each vector as an argument, and we're going to extend it linearly and multiplicatively. Uh, so for instance, it will expand like that. We're splitting the E1234 into f of E12 times f of E34. Uh, and again, we need to ask, are we allowed to do this? Uh, but I guess we asked that on a later slide. Oh yeah, here we go. So again, if we use the zero map, we're not allowed to do this, we get zero equals one again. So we need to work out what the conditions are under which this holds. Great, thank you. Uh, so the formal statement of this 
is that for any bilinear map from a vector space V to A, some algebra that satisfies F, of, that square symbolism mistake, sorry about that, uh, F of V, V is a quadratic form. And if you have these two, this function applied side by side and the middle two arguments are the same, then those contract out and move to the right. Uh, so any bilinear map that satisfies those rules will have a one-to-one -one correspondence between algebra maps from the even subalgebra to any algebra A. So again, they preserve multiplication and they're linear. Uh, and we can draw this pictorially. So I've, in this, this that we go from the pair of two vectors embeds in a natural way into even subalgebra by just taking those two vectors and multiplying them. Uh, but if we have any function from that pair of vectors to an algebra A, then we can lift that into a, a algebra map from the even subalgebra to A. So again, we're taking this map with a few properties and we're turning it into a map with more properties that applies to the bigger algebra. And I'm going to write this as a lift superscript plus. Uh, so I've said what the universal property is, but I haven't proved this work, so I haven't shown you how to implement it. Uh, so in fact, we can construct this even universal property out of the one we saw on the previous page, which shows that the universal property is universal and these, the even one is just built out of it. Uh, and so we're going to do this by looking at how we want it to behave. So as we saw earlier, we want it to break up these bivectors into pairs of vectors. Uh, but we saw on a previous slide that we can iterate over a multi-vector one vector at a time by using this endomorphism algebra. So here, if we apply lift with this endomorphism algebra, we get G applied to each vector in turn and a W naught at the end. And what this means is that if we can choose some H and some G such that H of this thing uh, equals um, FV1, V2, then those two expressions will be the same. And then we can implement our even universal property by applying lift with G, and then we're doing the post-processing with this H function. Now we just need to solve for W, H, W naught, and G. And this is of course gonna be a pain because W could be anything. It's a set of things. So that's where we are. But we can now use what we learned from the recursion slides about how to choose clever Ws. So in this case, we know that functions are useful and we know that pairs are useful. So inspired by the recursion slide, we're gonna pick W to be pairs of A and S for some state S. So the algebra that we want to produce and some intermediate state we haven't decided what to do with yet. We're gonna choose our post-processing post -processing to just be discard the state because we only needed it along the way. We don't need it at the end. And then we can choose our initial value W naught to be one because we want our function when applied to, well, because we need to satisfy H W naught equals one. So that falls out naturally. So that makes it a bit simpler what we have to solve. Um, so now we just need to find what S is and what G is. And what we can see is that we're, we're sort of applying G twice and we get F once. So we want the state to represent the half applied version of F. So when we call the function the first time, we apply it to the first argument. And when we apply it, call it the second time, it swaps them around and applies it to the, the other argument. Uh, so we implement G as this monstrosity, but we can substitute it and verify that we do indeed get what we want. Uh, and so we've chosen S to roughly be the space of linear maps for V to A. In fact, we've had to restrict it to some subspace, but this is already complicated enough, so I haven't shown that on the slides. Uh, we then need to check that we're allowed to apply the universal property with this function. So we need to check that the asterisk in this last equation is true. So we need F of V, V equals Q, V. And then the right-hand side of this pair, we also need to equate. And that is also kind of involved, so I'm not gonna show that here. But this lets us, eventually we recover the two conditions that I showed on the slide with the diagram. So we need to show that applied to the same vector twice, we get the quadratic form and applied to three vectors where the two middle ones are the same, the two middle ones pull out and we're left with just the first and third. So now we can return to what motivated all this. We want to go uh, to our motivating example, but in this time in the backwards direction. So we want to go from the even subalgebra back into the smaller regular algebra. And traditionally, we just want to remove all the E minuses from all the pairs. So when we have a pair of two E minuses, that obviously goes to minus one because E minus squared is minus one. Uh, the products of two vectors, so V1, V2 are unchanged. And if we have an E on the left, we just remove it. And if we have an E on the right, it turns into a minus sign. Uh, that minus sign is needed. Otherwise you end up with some contradiction when you swap the terms around. Uh, we can combine those four things linear, linearly to get the inverse function on pairs of vectors, which is sort of just a difference of two squares formula with different variables. And so we can then check that it matches our two rules. The first one follows naturally just by difference of squares. 
The second one isn't much more work, but I've skipped the intermediate step. So now we've confirmed this function is legal to use with the even universal property. And so we're done. We can now go in the other direction. So we have a function from the even subalgebra of the big algebra to the smaller algebra. We defined it just on the vectors. We didn't use the, any basis. Uh, and for free, we get the fact that it preserves multiplication and is linear. Uh, I've got a few more minutes. Uh, another example is you can go from, uh, you can negate the quadratic form. So the even subalgebra with a positive quadratic form is isomorphic to the even subalgebra with a negative quadratic form. And by isomorphic, I mean isomorphic as an algebra. Uh, and I have done on all previous slides too. Sorry about that. So more concretely, you can go from RPQ to RQP. That's what negating the quadratic form means. Uh, and this kind of might resolve some confusion on one of the early slides where I said that the um, quaternions were isomorphic to R0 of three, the even subalgebra of R0 is three, but more naturally we think of them as the even subalgebra of R3. And that's just adding this extra swap. Uh, I, yeah, so the mapping is simply take the product and add a minus sign. And I'll skip over this because I'm running short on time. Uh, so summarize the algorithms I found here don't need a basis on V. They don't even need B to, V to be finite dimensional. And in fact, they don't even need R to be a field. This works fine with R ring. It works fine if R is a characteristic two ring. So really weird cases are still fine with this construction. Uh, these generalizations might not seem useful to geometric algebra, but they are useful for building large libraries of formalized mathematics. Because when you formalize something in a library, you want everybody talking about Clifford algebras to be able to use that thing. So I don't want to formalize even subalgebras that work for GA people, but don't work for people doing Clifford algebra abstract things. You want one definition that works for everyone. Uh, the other advantage is that once you've got this general definition, then someone using this tool who only cares about GA could build some results that drive on it. And the tooling would tell them, oh, you've assumed that your um, base was a field, but it actually only needs to be a ring. So having the low level definitions with really weak requirements means that you could kind of let those bubble up into everything else and you realize your results are more general than you thought they were. Uh, and one such library of formalized mathematics is Lean's Matlib. And so all of the stuff on all these slides I've rigorously formalized in this Lean proving language. And there'll be a link at the end of the talk and there's also one in the paper. And so for instance, I can write down when I have a commutative ring R, a module or vector space V and some algebra A, I've got a quadratic form Q. And I can write the universal property is the equivalence between maps with this property and algebra maps from the Clifford algebra. I can do the same for the even sub algebra, but it's a bit more verbose. And I can write down the Clifford algebra of Q is isomorphic as an algebra to the even sub algebra of this thing with Q prime as its quadratic form. Uh, and this is just a picture that should maybe load, that kind of shows how big this math library is. So that little label down the bottom in the white blob. I can't see my cursor. That's the bit that I've been talking about today, somewhere over there. And then this is everything that it depends on. So these are huge libraries and you really need a bit of everything in order to build stuff up from nothing. So to conclude, I've demonstrated how to view the universal property through functional programming with these recursion examples and lists. I've shown how we can then use that to build the universal property for the even subalgebra. And then we can use that universal property to build this known map from the, a small algebra to a big even subalgebra in a way that doesn't need any basis. Uh, in the paper, I've also shown how we can use these same tricks to get the standard isomorphism between the linear isomorphism between a Clifford algebra and the exterior algebra, which is what you do when you take the wedge product or when you do grade selection. And all of these results are rigorously formalized in the lean to improver. Thank you, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay, questions. <laughs> sorry, sorry, what Apologies. was that? <laughs> <laughs> Have we got any questions on the chat? Uh, looks like we're screen one yeah. Shall I go back to not splitting screen? Oh yeah, yeah sure. That's it. Yeah, we can just go to the chat. Is he really an engineer? <laughs> yeah, David asks, is he really an engineering student? And he <laughs> is, yes. <laughs> Barely. Uh, there are two questions on, not so, what should I say, Zoom. Uh, the isomorphism R0, N, and R, N0 would this fully carry over to the results of cliff analysis formulated usually in R0, N. 
Uh, I'm not sure I understand which results you're talking about. Eckhart, could you clarify that? Uh, and while you're doing so. Yeah, if, if you like, I could say so. So uh, the Dirac operator in Clifford analysis usually as a basis vectors has vectors on squaring to plus one, but to minus one. And from that, they develop everything in Clifford analysis. So the that isomorphism only applies when you're working in the even subalgebra. So it's not R naught n and R n naught that are isomorphic, but R plus naught n and R plus n naught. Does that help with that question? Uh, a little, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, are there any geometric interpretations for going from the even to the big? Uh, I assume you mean here from going from the small algebra to the big even algebra? Uh, I don't know of what the geometric interpretation is. Largely, my impression is that the small algebra doesn't have a nice geometric interpretation and the big algebra does. So, for example, with the quaternions, the small algebra has this weird case where one of your ijk is a bivector and the other two are vectors, and the big algebra, all of ijk and now the bivectors. So there's more symmetry in the even subalgebra, the larger algebra, than there is in the smaller algebra. I hope that answers your question, Derek. Is the larger algebra? Uh, the larger algebra is the small algebra with an extra basis vector that's close to minus one. Uh, so it could be conformal. If your original algebra was G4, then your larger algebra would be the conformal one. Okay. Okay, so... Oh, hang on. Uh, one more from Hamish. One more Todd. from Hamish. Can it do Clifford algebras over arbitrary modules? Yes, it can. Is there a general formula for PQR over C? My impression is that the PQR comes from Sylvester's law of inertia over R, and over C, you don't need PQR, you just need PR or QR, because you can turn all of your squares to minus one into squares to one by just a coordinate transformation. <laughs> so yes, it can do them over arbitrary modules, but I don't know if your second question is meaningful. You could certainly set your base ring to C for everything I've done in this talk and it would all work fine. <laughs>